Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spectral Geometry in the Cloud. Uh, today, it's a pleasure to listen to Anke Paul from the University of Bremen, who's going to talk to us about fractal vial bounds. As usual, don't hesitate to ask questions, whether in the chat or directly by unmuting yourself. We will share the questions with the speaker. Uh, Anke, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for this invitation and the introduction. And also from me, please do not hesitate to ask any questions or interrupt me in between. I cannot see the chat. So please, if there's something in the chat, um, someone should kind of tell me. We, we will. Thanks. We will. No worries. Perfect. Thanks. So let me start. Uh, let me start by introducing what this here is about. So what we will do is we will consider a Riemannian manifold, let's say X. And soon it will be a very specific type of remaining manifold. And we want to consider the Laplacian on these manifolds. And what we want to do is we want to study the distribution of resonances. So it will become more clear what we talk about in a second. So instead of considering all kinds of remaining manifolds, what I actually want to consider today is hyperbolic surfaces or obi surfaces, however you want to call them. So um, let me draw a picture how they look like. So a typical hyperbolic surface looks like this. There's kind of a compact core. So here is a compact part. It can have any kind of holes, any number of holes in it. So any genus is allowed. And it can have two types of ends. So there it might have ends which have finite area, so like these here. So they become very narrow at the end, so they are actually accumulate only finite area. So these are called cusps. And it can also have ends which are very wide, so they accumulate um, infinite area, like these here. These are called funnels or maybe funnels if there are more. And what I'm not afraid of for the experts is I might have non-manifold points, so it might be an honest obby fold here. Uh, it will not make any appearance during the talk, but just for the experts. And also here for the experts, um, I will restrict to uh, geometrically finite surfaces, so finite number of cars, finite number of funnels. But for all the non-experts, just stick with the picture and you're perfectly fine. In a more rigorous way, what we talk about is um, we have a covering space of these um, surfaces, and this is given by the hyperbolic plane. So here's a model of the hyperbolic plane. Uh, it has a Riemannian metric, which comes with a line element like this. And there's a general rule for essentially all talks by me, ignore all formulas. All I want to show you is there are formulas. You can make everything precise. And so this um, space looks like this. It's just here, a half plane. Somewhere here is I. We're interested in straight lines, so we're interested in geodesics. They look like this. Either they are um, straight lines up or down, or they are semicircles orthogonal to the boundary, so center is somewhere here. We take a discrete subgroup of the group of Riemannian isometries, only the orientation preserving ones. These can be identified with SA2R, or to be absolutely precise, it's actually the projective version of that. Um, feel free to ignore this P here. Action then is by the well-known fractional linear transformation or Möbius transformation, as we all know from complex analysis. What we then need is the orbit space and this is um, our hyperbolic surface. In this setup, we can also write down an explicit formula for the Laplacian. So I'm using the standard coordinates here. So um, real part is called x, imaginary part is called z. Yeah, it just gives a formula here. Uh, for those which are physicists, I'm a bit sorry, I'm using the positive <laughs> um, Laplacian. Uh, feel free to have some minuses here and there. <laughs> Also, that doesn't matter too much. And I'm considering this as acting on the A2 space of all orbifold, of all manifold. So what we want to know is what can we say about the spectrum here? What is well known for quite a long time is a result by Lux and Phillips, which says that 
um, the spectrum decomposes into an absolutely continuous spectrum. Uh, the absolutely continuous spectrum is, I would say, as expected, starting at one quarter, going up to infinity. Um, there might be point spectrum. Point spectrum is it's a positive operator in zero infinity. And we may have embedded a two eigenvalues. And we will now take care mostly of the point spectrum. And to study this, it's actually a bit easier not to talk about the eigenvalues themselves, but their spectral parameters. So what does it mean? Whenever I have an eigenfunction, um, here comes then an eigenvalue and I decompose this eigenvalue in S times one minus S. This S is a complex um, number. So any number I can decompose in this way. And I now want, instead of considering eigenvalues, I want to talk about spectral parameters. Uh, we will see in a minute why. It just makes our life much easier. So let me first draw um, where the spectrum is located for different spaces. And we will notice, let me go up to my picture, that it now makes a uh, very much difference whether I have cusps or funnels or neither of those. So here it is. So let us first suppose that we are in a situation where we have neither funnels nor cusps. So our space is compact, so it essentially looks like this. Then let me draw the S plane. So this is our spectral parameter. So here's the real axis, here's the imaginary axis. Um, here's one half. Notice that one half times one half is one quarter, which is exactly the, um, the base of the um, co absolutely continuous spectrum. So here's this critical line. We have, and we do have a lot of embedded eigenvalues here. We also always have an eigenvalue here at one. So a spectrum parameter, sorry, a spectrum parameter is one. We have of course, one and zero, and we might have a finite number of additional ones somewhere here between zero and one, and then it's symmetric to the axis. What people are interested in for many reasons is counting these. Um, to spoiler here already, we have a full bylaw. So what does it mean? So what I want to do is I want to count how many spectral parameters I have in a ball around one half, a growing ball. So one half is the center, R is the radius here. I'm only counting A2 eigenvalues. And the bylaw says, I do know the asymptotics of this as my radius goes to infinity. And this is by now a well-known formula. It's about hundred years old and it goes like this. So it goes um, of the order squared, so radius squared. And then um, this constant here is also very interesting because it encodes the volume of the space in spectral information of the space. So let us now go to the situation that we have a non-compact space, but still a finite area, which means we have cusps, but no finite. So it looks like this. So here the situation is already much different. Here again, the imaginary part. Here the real part. Here's again one half. Here's again this critical axis. Here is one. One is again um, a spectral parameter as well as zero. I may or may not have embedded eigenvalues. There's a conjecture about, I will tell you in a second. I may or may not have additional eigenvalues here, and I may have spectral scattering resonances, so-called scattering resonances here. I will tell about these in a second. So um, let me first know, say what is noun. So forget at the moment about these additional points here, which I now make red. Um, and just focus on the proper A2 eigenvalues. What is actually the situation is that we don't know too much about these. 
There is a conjecture, um, still wide open actually, by Phillips and Sarak from 85, saying that on a generical um, surface, we shouldn't have too many L2 eigenvalues, meaning there should be only finitely many. There, there are known eigen uh, there are known surfaces which have additional structures, which are more rigid, which have additional symmetries, where we know we have a Weyl law, but generically it shouldn't be the case. So let me say it just in this way. Generically, only finitely many um, A2 eigenvalues. And so if you think about a complex surface and you try to deform it into a non-compact one, but just by kind of pulling it to infinity, some of this information of having these many A2 eigenvalues should be somewhere. And this is the reason why one um, relaxes the question here a bit. And instead of looking at A2 eigenvalues, one looks at a more general um, object. And these are called resonances. So um, let me first write a formula. So what we do is we take our Laplacian, we subtract the eigenvalue, we ask for the resolvent, but here now it plays a role that um, we are not talking about the eigenvalue itself. We talk about spectral parameters and having this split into um, uh, a spectral parameter. So having split our eigen, potential eigenvalues into uh, spectral parameters allows us to have a meromorphic continuation of this function here. And the poles of this um, function in the meromorphic continuation, these are called the resonances. Uh, for the experts here, I consider this as acting on um, A2 compact to um, the Zobolov space. So this additional, so every eigenvalue, every proper A2 eigenvalue produces, of course, here a pole. And there might be additional ones, and actually there are additional ones, which are, of course, scattering resonances, and these are here. And notice something, they are located in the strip between zero and one half. They are not in the negative part. This will play a role in a second. So instead of now counting um, eigenvalues, we will now count resonances in the same type of objects. So a ball around one half. This one half, by the way, doesn't play too much a role. So it's just a normalization here. May, may I ask a question? Uh, sure. So I, I, I was wondering um, about this uh, genericity um, assumption in the conjecture. Do, do we know? examples which are not generic where we would have infinitely many of these L2 eigenvalues. No, and this is an interesting thing about this conjecture. It's whenever we know something about the surface, it always satisfies the Weil law. Mm -hmm. So there is not a single noun example where we know that we do not have a Weil law. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the um, heuristics behind that <clears throat> is, I think, essentially um, numerics. Uh, so H H did quite a lot of numerics for, for these situations and um, deformation argument where they say, okay, um, take a arithmetic, so so-called arithmetic surface. So these are those where we know that we have that many uh, eigenvalues for Weil law and deform it. And then they say, okay, eigenvalues cannot be stable. They have to decay. They have to go away. Mm -hmm. It's a conjecture. Um, the numerics by HL are very promising. So he did it for Hecate triangle groups. Mm -hmm. And for Hecate triangle groups, it's known that the odd spectrum, so those which is invariant under the shift from one to minus one, still satisfies a Weil law. So kind of half of the spectrum satisfies a Weil law, but the even spectrum is then supposed to not satisfy it. And HL, mm -hmm. as far as I know, also couldn't find eigenvalues. So this is really promising, but there is no proof. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the situation as far as I know. So, and therefore, because of this um, 
unnice situation, let's say, we talk about all the resonances and start to count all of them. And then we do have again the Vylor. So um, there's a result by Selbeck, and then in addition, um, an extension of that by Werner Müller. Um, and the combination of these two shows that the resonance counting function again satisfies the Vylor. So what is left is spaces of infinite area. Spaces of infinite area, I must say, are not have not been studied for too long. So results are much younger here and also less complete. So an infinite area means you do have at least one of these funnels. And what is known then is already that there is no embedded um, A2. So whenever you have an A2 eigenvalue has to be, so um, let's say here's one, here's zero. It has to be somewhere here. Um, it is also known that there are therefore only finitely many A2 eigenvalues, namely these exceptional ones. And it's actually not clear if a Vylor is to be expected. So what makes this so difficult? So what we know is this, there is a first resonance, which is located at a point delta. Delta is at the moment just some number. The delta is below one. Right of this, there are no resonances. So here are no resonances. On the left of this line, we have resonances all over, they really spread out. There is a proof. They spread out to the four negative parts here. So to give you a better picture of how it actually looks like, or it might look like, I produce something in advance. So uh, tuck, one second. Here, you should see a picture or even a presentation mode. Is it true that you see a picture Yep, yeah, yeah, we yeah. see. Uh... Cool. So what you see is something, um, this is for so-called Schottky surface. So it's a surface which has no cusp and one funnel in our situation and one hole. So genus is one. Uh, this is a result of numerical examples, which I did with um, Oscar Bandlow. He is in London. I think a couple of you will know him. Torben Schick, who is a master student of mine, and Alex Weiser, who is um, the IT, the head of IT at the Max Planck in Bonn, and a physicist. And what we did is we uh, drew, we calculated numerically the resonances. And you see here's, here's a data. So here's a first point um, where it's kind of approaching. And then you see a little, uh, you see many, many, many little dots. Uh, because we have to draw dots, it sometimes looks like they are connecting to a line. They are not. This is a discrete set, which you see, but you also see it's really spreading out to the left side, and there's a lot of structure in which was not expected. So um, we were not the first to discover that there is more structure to expect it. This was um, David Borthwick. We just um, used a different algorithm, which, which we could go further into the negative uh, parts here. And this is, uh, there's a lot to study. This is what I want to say at this point. Okay. So you see, there is a lot of unknown um, territory with, uh, to be discovered here, and I cannot draw it in that nice way. So, what is known towards the Vylor? There is a result by Guilupe and Swoski. Take the resonance counting function, it is asymptotically what we expect. So there is an upper bound of um, the forms with some C1. And there's also a lower bound of this form. So it looks like a Vylor, but the constants are different at the moment. And it's not clear if they are the same. So as long as they are different, it's, it's not a Vylor. And it's really not clear if we should expect if they are the same, or if it's really that they are two different bounds and the, the counting is kind of wibbling between two, two asymptotics. It's not clear. This is just all we can say at the moment. 
So what would what should one do if one tries to count something and this is all we get, and but we have something which is spreading out to the left? Of course, a standard idea: chop it off and try to count in smaller parts. So what we now want to do is something like this. We have our imaginary axis, we have our real axis, we have our starting resonance somewhere here. We have here our line. We stop counting here at some sigma. And instead of counting in bolts, we count in boxes. Well, this should be symmetric to the axis. Something is wrong with my paper here. So this is a T. And this is also a T. OK, so what we want to do is count here. Excuse me, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so before you said there are no resonances in the left half plane, was this only true for finite area surfaces? Yes. Um, so this is, let's go up here. Um, when you're in finite area, there's nothing here. But okay. when you're in infinite area, there is a lot here. OK, thank you. Thanks for this question. That That is a really important point to, to um, see here. And this is also why this finite area world and the infinite area world are so much different. I think Laura <laughs> can tell you a lot of, of this. She's kind of living in this world much more than I do. So we want to count here. The sigma is fixed. And the t will go to infinity. So the counting function now reads like this. Um, here sigma and the t. Um, sorry, that should be an r. Um, so all the resonances, which have the real part um, at, at least um, the sigma, so it's in the box, and the imaginary part is bounded by t. And there's, of course, again, a conjecture. And this conjecture is somewhat interesting. Um, originally, I believe that this is based on physics. But then I really digged into this paper, and I saw it's just based on numerics. Oh, sorry, oh, I forgot Sposky here. Yep. So the conjecture says um, this kind of fractal counting should be asymptotically um, behave like t to the power of one plus data. So data is this first resonance, the value of the first resonance. And if we get something like this, it will, would be called a fractal bylaw. And of course, all the implied constants here, they may depend on the sigma. The motivation behind this exponent is like this. So the data is, so uh, what you take is, what, what you look at is uh, the geodesics of your surface, which are trapped on the surface. So these, which live on the surface forever. You look into the tangent bundle and you calculate the Hausdorff dimension and then it's half of the, maybe it's actually the full. It's the, it's the Hausdorff dimension of the set of trapped geodesics. So from a dynamical point of view, it makes sense to expect something like that. And of course, what also makes sense um, when you have a finite area surface, the data is one. And then it would just mean t to t squared, which is absolutely consistent with what we had before. OK, it's a conjecture, and it, it stays a conjecture. Also, after today, at the moment, it just stays a conjecture. But there are partial results. So a result by Swarovski. And then proven again, but with different methods by Guilupi, Lynn Swarovski. So what they do is um, they consider short key surfaces, which means it's a, um, a hyperbolic surface, which has funnels, but no cusps. So it looks like this, or typically like this. And for these surfaces, they could prove um, the upper bound. So lower bounds are much more difficult and much worse by today's knowledge, but they got an upper bound, which is the conjecture. So it's half of the conjecture in a certain sense. And what I want today, today uh, what I want to do today is to prove something similar, but for surfaces which have cusps. 
And this is a result together with Frederick No and my former student Suarez. And let me just state it um, for, let me say certain, it will become clear in a moment what means certain um, hyperbolic surfaces of infinite area, at least one cusp. Um, I want to say, of course, with this geometrically finite, this is just for the experts. Know that if, if you don't like it. So we aimed at proving the same bound, but we couldn't. So we ended up with an additional term here. Um, yeah, we just ended up there. And um, you can also read it like this with an implied constant depending on an epsilon. It is the upper bound with an epsilon error, but this for all epsilon. Okay, let me first say what means certain. Um, certain at the moment means, um, so what is available in written up form is um, one class, it's Hecker triangle groups. The method is much more general. It um, is based on existence of a certain type of operators, which we will see in a second. And then it becomes also, the result immediately becomes more general because of the structure of the result. We are at the moment writing up this more general result. And then this certain um, can be read as almost all. Uh, I will come to what means almost all. So it's, it's not our fault that it's not all at the moment. It's uh, actually the fault of that we don't have any, some tools at our disposal, which we would need to have, but it's more a different group, which is at the moment working on producing these tools. And actually I'm a member of the other group. So it's actually my fault. <laughs> I, I don't want to blame anyone. I just want to say, okay, this result, there is a certain structure in, as soon as one preliminary tool is provided, it immediately kicks in and produces you this bound. So what I plan to do now is in the last, let's say half hour minus a few seconds, I give you a sketch of the proof where I want to focus on the big ideas and I would put a lot of these details under the rug, but I will try to explain where are the differences to the short key situation? So what makes the difficulty of a cusp? Where, where comes it in? Where, and also meaning where are we losing this epsilon or let's say gaining this epsilon. So we, where we earn this epsilon, which actually we do not want to have, but it's also not so clear if it should be there or not. You will see. So let's start with a sketch. The um, basic idea of this is even though this is a spectral result, we want to get as much dynamics into the picture as possible. The intuition behind that is that there is this correspondence from physics between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, which tells you that from a mathematical point of view that any kind of spectral information should have kind of a dynamical or geometric counterpart. And we want to use these dynamical counterpart to study the spectral side. Um, also the second proof of this result up here, the, the proof by Gilupi Linswarski was using such an approach and it worked very well. So the first step what we do is um, look at the Zabbix zeta function. It is this function here let me first write it down and then explain what this is about. So there is an infinite product over all the periodic geodesics on our surface. So periodic means closed, so they close up. So they have a length, length is called lambda, um, it's, it's an L. <laughs> and then it's essentially an Euler product. So there comes a second auxiliary product in, which is needed for um, theoretical purposes here. And then it's e to the minus s plus k, and then this length. So um, this infinite product converges for um, real part s is larger than our famous delta. It has a meromorphic continuation um, to all of c. And what we use from this is this, um, ah, sorry, um, 
it has a zero, even only if, up to some little mistakes I will ignore here, if this S is a resonant, or it's there for another reason, and this is called a topological zero, let us ignore for today these topological zeros. We know where they are, they are not that many. So we can read this result as this. The Zebig zeta function in its meromorphic continuation has a zero if and only if, has a zero at S, if and only if this S is a resonance. So what does it mean? The Zebig zeta function, if you look at it, all information that goes in are the length of periodic geodesics. So this is a dynamical object. What you get out of this via its zeros is the full set of resonances. Even if you look into more details with multiplicities and so on, but all this is information I will put under the rug for today. So why does it help us? We have this resonance counting function, which we're counting resonances in a box. So instead of counting resonances, we can now count zeros of the Zebig zeta function. So the same box. And instead of now saying S should be a resonance, I say it should be a zero of the Zebig zeta function. There are slightly more zeros than resonances. So I have a slight overcounting here typically. And this is the first step of getting some dynamics into the picture. So now comes the next step, which will make our life easier, even though at the moment, when you first look at it, it looks more complicated. So what are we trying to do at the moment? So we have here, so here's theta, here's sigma. We try to count in such a box. So here's T. Now, instead of counting in a box of height T and depth T, I want to count in smaller boxes and then add up these boxes. So instead of counting everything all together, I want to count in small boxes separately. So this goes like this. Um, and all of my boxes, by the way, will have um, height two, and then the center point will move up and down. So I will call this counting function M. So I'm counting resonances with the property that the real part of my resonance is at least sigma, and the imaginary part is away from t at most one. So I hope the picture is not too irritating. So what I'm actually counting here is this box in this box up here. And then the t moves up and down. And when I add enough t's, I get the n counting. OK, and of course, I can do the same now, sorry, the same now trick as before. I can count in my box. And instead of saying it should be a resonance, I ask for zeros of my Zebig zeta function. It's again a slight overcounting, but we don't worry. It's, it's really a finite, well, it's always a finite number, but it's a very finite number. Then by Jensen's formula, what you can do is, because everything here is very smooth, you can get this into a statement purely about the growth of the Zebig zeta function. So what you have to do here is to take the max over a certain circle here, this R here, it depends on sigma and this is not, we depend on the T. So what it means for us is, or we now need to do is to estimate this here. And this looks much nicer than having this strange set where you try to count. It's now essentially became kind of a problem in, in analysis. So what we would like to have for the original conjecture would be this, but what we get, and this is the result which I wrote down is this. So how do we arrive there? Um, all of those, of you who have already worked with the Zebig zeta function, they know that the Zebig zeta function in this business is used very much to count objects and also very successful for um, by now 70 years. But somehow it, it also kind of has, it, has its limits because, uh, uh, let me go back. 
Um, when you look again at the defining formula, all that goes in from the dynamics is the length of geodesics. It's a static object. It's actually a geometric object. It's not a dynamical object anymore. What is not going in is the motion along periodic geodesics, also not the relation of different periodic geodesics to each other. How is the motion on the one geodesic related to the one on the other geodesic? And this kind of dynamics is something we would like to put in addition into this picture and pull information out of that. How do we do that? So more dynamics. So let me take a generic surface. Let's say this, or oh, it should have a funnel. Um, when you consider the geodesic flow on this, it looks a bit like this. It is very chaotic. And if you want to study it kind of with the full information you have, via the flow, it becomes very complicated. So what we do is we discretize the geodesic flow. How does one do this? One takes a cross section, so a Poincaré section, somewhere in the unit tangent bundle is set, which is discrete for the flow. So whenever a geodesic kind of enters into this cross section, it immediately leaves it. When you do this in a clever way, and there is an art behind, which has now became a method, you get out of this by a lot of procedures in the background, a map, which is acting on a disjoint union of certain intervals on air, on R. Think about um, the Gauss map or continued fractions. Uh, common features of these maps is that it's piecewise given by fractional linear transformations of certain elements of gamma. And remember, gamma was the fundamental group of our surface here. So there is a full one hour talk behind how one constructs this. Therefore, at the moment, I unfortunately have to ask you to believe me that it's possible to do that in a very nice way. Um, for the Gauss map or the continued fractions, which is the same in this situation, um, this is this has been known for a long time. This goes back to Emil Artin. Um, then there is a nicely written paper by Caroline Siri. So Emil's, Emil Artin's paper is in German, so uh, not, not a big problem for me. <laughs> um, and Caroline Siri's paper is very nicely written, which does it for the modular group. And then it's a big generalization of that kind of approach here. So what do we get from that? When you have this map and pretend, ju just pretend that this map is kind of a discrete version of the geodesic flow. It's not fully correct, but it helps in thinking and just almost correct. So with this map, we form a so-called transfer operator. And this looks like this. You take this map, this additional parameter S in, which is the same as at the spectral parameters before. Then you take a function on this union of intervals to, let's say, C. Um, consider this function as being a density, a mass distribution of this union of intervals. And you now ask for how does this mass distribution behave under one application of the capital F? So how it is kind of redistributed. Then you just go into the standard formulas and you end up with this. So what do you have to do? You take your point. We want to understand the situation. You take all the pre-images, so all the points where information comes to your point. Um, you add them up, the value at these points, and then there is a weight in. Standard weight would be minus one, but because uh, this is physics motivated and there has to be somewhere this S, here's my S. So this S up here is the S from here. Think about this um, operator as a discretization of the Laplacian. And then essentially also think this, when you have an eigenfunction here, it does not need to be an L2 eigenfunction. Think about this eigenfunction more like the one eigenfunction of your Laplacian divided by the eigenvalue. And then say, 
if everything is fine, they should somehow correspond to an eigenfunction here with eigenvalue one. It looks strange at the moment, but this is actually true. So with this, if, if you have a well chosen F, of course, um, what does it have to do with all that, what we do? The Zabik zeta function is the Fretholm determinant of this operator. So what have we done up to now? We have had this Zabik zeta function, which is formed by the periodic geodesic, so the static information of the dynamics on your surface. Then we have said, okay, this is not enough dynamics into the picture. We take um, an additional kind of discrete version of the geodesic flow, which is our capital F. We form this transfer operator out of that. So this is now encoding motion along geodesics in a very mixed way. And now the fret term determinant, just say the determinant of this operator gives back the Zabbix zeta function. So there is hidden the actual dynamics in this operator, taking the determinant means getting this information again to a static version. But it also means that studying the zeros of the Zabbix zeta function is now equivalent to asking for which spectral parameters S do we have a one eigenfunction of the, lab, uh, of the transfer operator. And this will help us in our picture. So the question here is, of course, uh, when do we have this here? Or which kind of surfaces? So I did some work on that um, over the last, uh, by now, 15 years. Um, in exactly that form, I produce it for Hecker triangle surfaces, which is also the reason why many works where I'm kind of involved in start with these surfaces as test cases. And then with my student who, by the way, defended last week, um, we extended this to almost all um, hyperbolic surfaces, also OB surfaces. So this is now very general result here. And then there is a paper coming with uh, Charlotte Pfeiffer. And that if, if it all works out the way I think, this will then um, get actually all papers, uh, sorry, um, all surfaces into this picture. So there is a technical thing that Paul and I inherited from an older paper of me, and I hope that this paper will kill this technical assumption. Sitting at this point that we needed to estimate the growth of the logarithm, this now means estimating the growth of this Fretholm determinant. And this now looks much nicer because you now all the function analysis which is available is allowed to kick in. And these is, are objects which allow an estimate of this form. And this is um, the mth singular value of our operator. So let me give you a certain insight how these operators look like from a form on which spaces they act. And then let's get into estimating these singular values. And don't worry, I will end in time. So our transfer operators. They are built from two types of actions, or let's say it's the same action, but two types of elements. So there is a contribution from certain elements in our fundamental group, which look like this. It's just a summoned in our operator, which looks like exactly this. You recognize the fractional linear transformation, and then it's just the derivative here. This is the harmless part. And then there is coming the cusp contribution. For every cusp which we have, there will be one parabolic element, at least one parabolic element, which is contributing to the transfer operator by this form. Um, this n goes from zero to infinity. And this is up to some conjugation and some coordinate change. It is essentially this type of operator. So when you have short key surfaces, you only have these type of actions. So your transfer operator itself is a finite sum of these two types of actions. For short key surfaces, you only have this orange um, part here, which is much easier to estimate. 
And as soon as you have a cusp, you have this additional part in here. And just forget the F at the moment. What you have here is a Hurwitz zeta function. And this makes problems. Um, it's not even convergent for all S. So here at this po point, what you need is a meromorphic continuation for working in the important parts. And this is where part of our problems in the estimates come from. And maybe it also says, it's not clear, maybe it says eventually that these additional terms are, are needed. So what are our domains? So let me first look at the Schottky surface. It typically looks like this, right? And when you unfold it, let's take here the disk model, fundamental domain look like this, looks like this. So we are interested in periodic geodesics. So we are not interested in geodesics, which move like this because they leave the space eventually. So we are not interested in geodesics, which end here. And then when you take um, the neighboring fundamental domains here, you're also not interested in geodesics, which end here or here or here. Then you take again the neighboring fundamental domains, you're not interested in geodesics which end here, 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 here. And if you do this infinitely often, what you will end up is the limit set. And this famous delta, by the way, is the dimension of this limit set. So in our situation, when we have a cusp, fundamental domain look like this, for example, it's just a simple fundamental domain. You do the same game. So you're not interested in anything here, anything here. And then also all these neighboring fundamental domains. You're not interested in this and this and this and this. And you will also end up with a set of remaining points, which is then of course the limit set. But there is a big difference between a Schottky surface because the limit set at every space kind of looks the same in kinds of density. When you have um, a cusp, the cusp itself is a point in the limit set. And around the cusp, the limit set is denser than at other points where you do not have a cusp. And this will make a difference for us. So our transfer operator should, from a point of view of dynamics, live on functions based on this limit set. But this is a fractal set, so we have problems with the, numeric, with the functional analysis on these sets. So what we do is we thicken our set. So we take our limit set. Here, this is the limit set. Add to every point in a limit set, a little ball of radius h. So this is a ball in C. With this ball and with this kind of thickened set, we can work. So for sufficiently small h, this transfer barrier which we have is living on the um, Hilbert Bergman space on this thickened set. So uh, remember, this just means it's the holomorphic functions plus um, A2. What do we have then? On this space, we are now allowed, well, let's say we have tools to estimate our um, singular values. And this goes like this. Um, I will first write down again and then explain a bit. So the first ingredient which goes in into this estimate is the number of connected components of this thickened set. Um, the limit set itself was fractal, but if you glue to every point in the limit set a ball, some of these points connect, but others do not. So we have this number of connected components in here which I call n. Of course, the n depends on the h. The dependence will be, we come into a formula in a second. Then we have one over what is called the contraction rate, connected components as h goes to zero. Then we have an additional factor. Uh, this little c is just some component, uh, some constant which is depending on the level of the singular value divided by the number of the connected components. And then we have an additional uh, component, which is an A2 estimate, A2 norm in this case, of the prefectures of 
in our transfer operator. So let me first go into this prefactor business here. Um, what does that mean? Our transfer operator consists of these two components or components of these two forms. The prefactor is this. So for these finite Gs, it, we do not have to worry about that. But here we will have to worry about this. And this will actually have a contribution. So the formula of this form, uh, it's nothing we invented, is something we um, took from a paper, wonderful paper by uh, Bundlow and Jenkinson and then adapted it to, to our situation. And now we just calculated all these components. So based on dynamics, you can calculate the number of connected components to be h to the minus delta. This delta is again this famous um, first resonance. The contraction rate is one over h. Then uh, we have this factor, which is just there. Then the prefactor comes in with this. And then you combine it together, you get this. Uh, these the c's, they might be different c's. So everything which is a little c is some constant. And then we optimize. Optimize means that h is almost um, the same as one over the imaginary part. It's actually not fully true, but for all purposes, it's good enough. So let, let me call this one over t. And then you get, so let me um, give you one more information of what is happening here. When you look at our final results, which now says, um, um, yeah, the, the counting, what we have is bounded above by T to the delta and then log T to two minus delta. Um, then this two minus delta comes from this component. So this is kind of causing us a headache at the moment. This delta here, and actually the full contribution, this, this contribution, this data is exactly that data, which is up here. And this contribution is exactly that. Why do we have this t to the two half, three half um, data? This is here. We have this contraction rate, which is an upper estimate of the contraction rates. It is sharp on those contraction points where the contraction is not fast, but around cusp is actually faster. But the cusp presence, the presence of the cusp produces this part. So unfortunately, in both situations, we have to take the worst situation of what is actually happening. And these two add up to an additional one half delta, which is not canceling this year, and therefore, we end up with it here. So at that point, let me stop. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Anke, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we now have time for some questions, if anybody uh, has them. So you can either unmute yourself and uh, ask them, or ask them in chat, and we will relay them. I, I guess I'll, I'll... Oh, uh, Laura, you had a question? Yeah, I was uh, wondering, uh, so in your results, you have a box and you take the this size to increase. Um, do we know anything about the dependency with regards to sigma? And can we also look at the other limits? Um, let, let me say it this way. We cannot. So um, we have not tried to understand the dependence on the sigma and I from what I did is I understand that it's really complicated. Of course, it would be nice to understand, okay, the, the sigma is kind of hidden in the implied constants. Um, what happens if I move the sigma? But um, I think our estimates are not, not good when it comes to the sigma. So in the conjecture, it is that there's an equivalent or is it that, there's a, that it's asymptotically equivalent to t to the power one plus delta? Um, it is equivalent up to a constant which depends on the sigma. So it should fully read like this. Um, uh, da -dum, da -dum. 
like this. Um, so the conjecture is, is only stated in this form, but what I make out of this is more like this. Here should be um, a constant which depends on the sigma. This is how I understand the conjecture. And then of course, as um, T goes to infinity, so he might be lower order terms. Okay, and is it, because uh, that's a numerical conjecture, right? So yes. is it possible to kind of have an idea of how the constant depends on sigma perhaps, So No idea. No, it's too difficult. No, okay, no, no. I, I don't see any any idea here at the moment. Well, thank you. Thanks, uh, for the question. Do we have other questions for Anka? Yeah, uh, hello, do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, go on. I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Now, I have a question about a remark you made about the zeta function. You said it, uh, you said it had limits because it only contained information about the lengths of geodesics. And can you elaborate about this a little bit? Yes. Um, let me go and just give you the formula here again. So um, how I started out in this full business is like this. I wanted to understand um, eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator. I wanted to understand how these are related to eigenfunctions to some kind of um, dynamical object and actually how they are related to eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, uh, sorry, of the transfer operator. So what is possible and what was possible also for some years is um, to understand um, this relation, which we have here. So, but when I give you a resonance, you have, so when I give you a resonance via the, the Zabbix zeta function, you have no chance to give me an eigenfunction for that resonance from the Zabbix zeta function. Because the Zabbix zeta function, all, all the information it has is the S. There's no function involved. But when you have this here, and you tell me, okay, I'm at a situation where this is zero, I know that there needs to be an eigenfunction. The only question what I have is what is this eigenfunction, right? Mm -hmm. And so the transfer operator itself has more information of the Laplacian than the Zabbix zeta function because the Zabbix zeta function is quite kind of forgetting some part of the dynamics. So it, it cannot reproduce you any eigenfunction, but for very good situation, this appears actually a bijection. Okay, In I that see. sense, it has more information. I see, thank you. But, but the, this transfer operator that you're talking about, I mean, uh, because the transfer operator that I've heard about is just the pullback of functions by the flow. Is this related in any? Yeah, 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 Th that is related. Um, let me go back to my formula. Yep. Um, this, this formula up here, so um, the well, yellow is something we cannot see. The orange one is the spelled out formula for the pullback of measures. And typically when people do that, uh, so when they only talk about pullback of measures, they take S equals one. And then for um, the Laplacian, you do not gain much information. But when you have this flexibility with the S, so it's uh, in terms of physics, it's an inverse temperature. Then um, the S becomes the spectral parameter of the eigenfunction you look for. And then it makes more sense um, of using it in this form here. And it actually goes back to Ruel. Yeah. A lot okay. of physicists in, in this business. Okay. Does it answer your question? I mean, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting formula, but uh, I can't see exactly how it's related to the pullback immediately. But uh, I was. Uh, um, there is a second it. formula. Um, da, 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 da. It's um, sorry. I will try to reproduce the formula. Um, so um, I have a function, yeah, and then um, I have the map somehow. I think I need a test function, something like this. So don't um, nail me down on this here for the recording. <laughs> um, I think it's like this. Mm -hmm. And then you have a measure here. And this then essentially means that you pull back exactly that measure. Okay. It's something like this, but this okay. only works if the S is one. Okay, okay, I see. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. 
Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for for this question. Uh, I, I I have a question myself. Uh, uh, so so this um, this logarithm logarithmic term that appears um, yeah in in this are, are are you do you know this paper of um, Chito, uh, Prandi, and Rizzi, where they um, get vial laws for singular Riemannian manifolds. Um, in particular, the, the interesting thing is that these are manifolds that have infinite volume, but in a way, uh, they have some sort of, of boundary at infinity, and the uh, neighborhoods of these boundaries at infinity, uh, they, 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 the, way, the way the volume increases towards there is somewhat slowly. And uh, one thing that they show is that there is a logarithmic term in the vial law for Ooh. these uh, manifolds. So it's, it's some power times some log, which, which is actually there. Yeah, that's cool. So, it sounds so, a bit like there should be something like this. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a very different context. It's not in surfaces, it's not a hyperbolic, it's some sort of sub Riemannian structure, which is a limit of Riemannian structures in, 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 in some way. I mean, I, I would have to reread. I've read the paper some time ago. It's not, uh, but uh, in this infinite volume uh, situation, it, I, I found it interesting that there was this, this uh, actual logarithmic presence. And I, I, it made me think of uh, this uh, uh, situation in, in that you were presenting there with just the upper bound. Maybe it's not that spurious, in fact. But this sounds really good. So what I I'm worried about here is this um is it's not really the logarithmic term I'm fully worried about is the two, because like yeah. this. So if, mm -hmm. if we would have this, and then just um take delta as one. So if you just mm -hmm. pretend that we kind of have a how should I say a continuous upper bound when it comes mm -hmm. from infinite surfaces to finite ones. Mm -hmm. Um, then for delta equals one, this would be fine because the logarithmic term vanishes and the t to the square is to the two is exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. Now, when the delta is one in the formula which we get, we have kind of log t in addition. And this yeah. we would like to yeah, get yeah, rid of. But <sighs> at the moment, it's really like this that all the estimates we do. I even checked one today again, so it took me like five hours. <laughs> it is sharp. So, of course, there are some constants in which are not sharp, but the power is sharp. Uh -huh. The order is okay. So, at the moment, I don't see a way with this method to get rid of the two. Okay. We'll turn the two into one. Yeah, it's it's right. It presented like this. I I, I would indeed much prefer seeing a one there. Uh... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But it yeah. also shows there is still something to do. I mean, it took us already quite some work to get it to uh, at this result here. So we are quite happy with that already. But now we could go on and try to improve the, the two. Of course, uh, of course. But yeah, yeah, like I said, for me, there was this 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 question of, of is the log in fact? Uh, uh, do, 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 we have, do we have other questions for Anka? OK, well, I think we can. Uh, uh, so here and uh, thank uh, Anka again for the nice talk today, and uh, we will reconvene next week uh, with a talk by uh, Clara Lucia Dana Dominguez on uh, quasi exospectral potentials. And uh, for uh, those in uh, the Americas, we're returning to the usual time, and uh, see you all uh, uh, next week. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, again. thank you very much. That was great.